Lord, I bow to you, Allah, Allah, you are my Lord, I bow to you, Allah, Allah, you are my Lord, I bow to you, Allah, Allah, you are my Lord, I bow to you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillah. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We are learning and analyzing taking lessons from the story of Yusuf عليه السلام He is Yusuf عليه السلام the son of Yaqub عليه السلام the son of Ishaq alayhi salam, the son of Ibrahim alayhi salam. A great honor, a prophet, son of three prophets. And this is the prophet of Allah whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given extraordinary beauty, half of the beauty of Adam alayhi salam. And no one will ever reach the beauty of Yusuf alayhi salam or Adam alayhi salam. Allah also gave him the miracle of being able to interpret dreams precisely. He never faltered in their precise interpretations. He also knew how to administer and manage the interpretations of dreams, what to do about it. So not only did he know its meanings, he also knew what to do about it. He knew how to go about carrying out this dream in the way that Allah wants him or what he has revealed to him. He also knew of certain things of the future which Allah revealed to him, near future, such as what's, what's going to come to you tomorrow of provision. Yusuf alayhi salam was one of those prophets whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen as one of also his messengers. He went through so much mental pain and he also went through a lot of physical pain as well. We finished off last week. We ended where Yusuf السلام, had been seduced by the woman of his master. His master was a minister for the king, for the pharaoh. And he was the treasurer of the land. His wife or his woman seduced Yusuf alayhi salam. And after that, the women, noble women, her friends, accused her of being a mad woman because she's trying to seduce a slave of hers. To them, it was unheard of that a woman of such high status and wealth would desire a slave. Because a slave to them is a nobody. But this man was not any ordinary slave. He was Yusuf alayhi salam. So when she heard about them, she called them in. And she tested them herself. They shared some fruit. And as they were cutting away their fruit and enjoying their conversations together, she asked Yusuf alayhi salam to come out in front of them. And she made him dress in beautiful clothing. When they saw him, these women, they gratified him. They were shocked in absolute dismay. They became hypnotized to his looks and paralyzed in their feelings, in their body. So much that as they were cutting the fruit, some of them didn't realize that they were cutting through the fruit and slicing through their palms with the knives. They were looking at Yusuf alayhi salam and didn't realize that they were slicing their hands repeatedly from the beauty that Allah had given Yusuf alayhi salam. Some of the past scholars assume that they, of the opinion that Yusuf alayhi salam was so beautiful that he would cover his face often whenever he was out and about. He would cover his face for a reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only knows. So not many people actually laid eyes on him, didn't see him. Others, they say, he was mostly trapped inside the home as a slave and hardly anyone wanted to even ask about a slave, so hardly anyone noticed 
his looks, no one looked for him. And other scholars, they consider, and this is probably too much exaggeration, Allahu alam, but you might come across it in tafsir books, that if a that women used to find it difficult to look at Yusuf salam from a close distance because of the amount of radiance his face had. So it was hard for them to look at him at close distance. They had to move back because there's so much radiance of light coming out of his face. I think that's an exaggeration because there's no dalil to it. However, Yusuf salam was extraordinary in that beauty. Just to explain to you the extent of this. They gratified him and said, No. By God, this is not a man. He is an angel which is God sent. From the heavens, an angel descending upon us, full of light. The, the woman said, who was his master, master, she said, This is the man whom you blamed me for. And look what happened to you. And if he doesn't do what I am calling him to do, I'm calling him to do something very dirty. And that is zina. I want to have zina with this man. And if he doesn't respond, she said, I am the one who seduced him. He refused. He resisted. He protected himself from it. So she actually praised Yusuf salam's actions. But at the same time, knowing that his actions are noble and knowing that her actions are are innoble, she still followed her desires. Her temptations and desires overtook her. Her nafs, as Allah describes it in the Quran, and the nafs in the way Allah has designed it. He gave it the tendency to do evil. And, and, and explode in evil and he gave it a tendency to follow in righteousness whoever purifies this nafs and here is a good example in Yusuf about the meaning of purifying the nafs the nafs is like a child brothers and sisters it requires you to train it and develop it and teach it you need to punish it when it needs to be punished and you need to reward it when it does something good. You are in fact punishing and rewarding yourself. But the cause of that is the nafs which is in, Allah has created with inside you. It, it, we can't explain the nafs. But it's a feeling with inside you which makes you feel that you want to do bad or do good. To serve yourself in some way or another. Whether it be theft, lying, hurting, murdering, cheating, stealing or committing adultery or fornication, looking at haram in secret or in open, speaking of haram in secret or in open, and so on and so forth. Or the nafs tells you, go and do good, charity, say a good word, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, use your time in halal rather than haram, this is the nafs as well. You reward it when it is patient in those times. Reward it with halal entertainment for example. Reminded of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasures upon you in Jannah. And so on and so forth. The woman of the Aziz, of the minister, she wanted to follow her desires. That had overcome her. And the women went to Yusuf alayhi salam trying to convince him to obey her. Because they didn't want him to end up in prison. So what did Yusuf alayhi salam do? He went in the night praying to Allah, seeking his refuge from what they are calling him to do. Seeking his refuge. We seek Allah's refuge for protection from things that harm us. This is one of the greatest harm. Because if he falls prey to it, he would have lost both his loyalty in this world and his loyalty to Allah in the next. Because listen to what he says in his dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, قَالَ رَبِّ السِّجْنُ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا يَدْعُونَنِي إِلَيْهِ وَإِلَّا تَصْرِفْ عَنِّي كَيْدَهُنَّ أَصْبُ إِلَيْهِنَّ وَأَكُمْ مِنَ الْجَاهِلِينَ He said, O oh my Lord, the dungeon is more beloved to my heart than what they are calling me to do. Hmm. 
And if you do not deter them away from me and protect me from them, I may fall prey to them because I am weak. Asbu ilayhin, my nafs, my nafs as well, because Yusuf is also a human. He has a nafs like you and, my, like you and me. He said, if you do not deter them away from me, my nafs may get the better of me, and I may fall prey to my own weakness. Yes, he's a prophet of Allah, but he is a human, and humans have weaknesses. And this is the great wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending prophets as humans like you and me. The disbelievers at the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu used to say the following words, Why? Why would God send a man like us as a prophet? Couldn't he have chosen an angel? Why a man who walks the streets and the markets like every one of us, eats the food and needs, to, and needs this for survival like every one of us? Allah says, replies to them, if he sent you a prophet as an angel, you would have said, well, he's an angel. We can't compete with an angel. We're humans. That's what Allah replied to them with. So he's a human in order to show us how to live our lives as humans. Not as angels, because we are humans made of dust and clay. We are not made of light like the angels. They are different to us. So Allah is fair and just and wise. Yusuf السلام, said, I may fall prey to them in my weakness, and I may become one of the jahileen, one of the ignorant ones. Brothers and sisters, a jahil doesn't necessarily mean only someone who doesn't know pieces of information. Ignorant. Ignorance in Arabic, in the Qur'an, especially in Islamic terms, has greater meanings than only that. Ignorance starts with lack of knowledge, but the greatest ignorance is a person's wrong actions. When they know the wrong, and they still fall in the wrong. They know the wrong, and they still fall in the wrong. Their conscience tells them what's wrong, and they still go ahead and do it knowingly. This is a jahil, an ignorant person. One of bad character, one of bad adab, manners, one of bad to himself and to others, corruption. This is a jahil. That's why it's called Asr al Jahiliya, the, the era of the Jahiliya, of the Jahils before the Prophet Muhammad. They did wrong things and evil things knowingly, and they didn't address their conscience to lead them in the right direction. They blind followed. This is all jahil, ignorance in all of its meaning. So my brothers and sisters, a person who follows their lustful desires becomes a jahil, becomes a person of ignorance, of corruption, dirtiness, filth in their mind and in their body and in the eyes of other people. Which one of you here would give their daughter or their son more the daughter because you have more, uh, you have more control, more or less, over the daughters according to Islam because you become the wali as a father. As for the sons, they can overpower you and run away, generally speaking. I know it happens to both. But which one of you would accept to let your daughter or your son marry someone who is in the habits of this type of lustful temptations? Their eyes keep going out and about in places where they shouldn't go. Their hands touch places where they shouldn't be. They go to places and talk and, 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 and be in places where they shouldn't be following their lusts. Which one of you will accept to marry someone like that? A person like that, Allah says in the Quran, An adulterer, man or fornicator, will not marry except another or will not sleep or have intercourse with anyone other than another zaniya, an adulteress or fornicatress. And a zaniya will not have intercourse with another man except another zani like her. Corruption meets corruption. And these are the ones worth for each other. A pure person is not worth for an impure person. An impure person is not deserving of a pure person unless they repent to Allah sincerely and leave what they had in the past and even then, when you know it, the self begins to tell you, your mind tells you, you know, you're reluctant to give that person in marriage. Even when you know their past and they've repented. Isn't that right? So that's a person who's repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah has forgiven. What about a person who's still indulging in such behaviors? This is a jahil, ignorant in the deepest of words. It makes you among the lowest of the low. 
you'd be up here and then suddenly you're down here in the eyes of the people. This is filth. And you can feel it. You can feel it in yourself when you begin to obey these desires. There is an imam by the imam of Imam Malik, rahmatullahi alayhi. You all know the famous Imam Malik. Uh, he says that he used to memorize so quick. Like he'd look at a page once, they say. And when he'd, turn, he, when he'd look at the other page, he'd have to cover the former page so that his memorizations don't mix. This is how quick he memorized. Maybe it's an exaggeration. But it's not an exaggeration to say that he had extraordinary memory. He says, one time I'm memorizing. I looked up and a woman came past. He says it in a form of poetry. He talks in his poem. A woman came past. And I accidentally saw parts of her shins at the bottom, her legs. I looked for a little while and then I turned away. Just, just like subtly, I turned away. I came to memorize and my memory was taunted. I couldn't memorize as well as before. It was less. He says in his poem, فَشَكَوْتُ إِلَىٰ وَكِيعٍ سُوءَ حِفْظِي فَأَرْشَدَنِي إِلَىٰ تَرْكِ الْمَعَاصِي وَقَالَ إِنَّ الْعِلْمَ نُورٌ وَنُورُ اللَّهِ لَا يُهْدَى لِعَاصِي I complained to my teacher Waqi' my lackness in my memory than before. Then he guided me to stay away from disobedience of Allah. He knew I had told him what I had done. So this is disobedience. Stay away from it. Avoid it. Because the knowledge of Allah is made of is light. It is nur. And the light of Allah cannot be given to the disobedient. So you see your knowledge begins to go less. Your memory goes less. Your hifd of the Quran and hadith go less. You come to remember, you can't remember. And it becomes more and more. And your mind becomes cloudy. Not only in your religious knowledge, but even in other types of knowledge. Worldly knowledge. Your judgment becomes cloudy. And I don't want to give you examples when I have time about all those businessmen and people who are so-called successful in the worldly life, who followed their lusts and temptations, and look what became of them. The higher you go in, in position, the more dangerous it is to follow your lusts. And if they want to destroy a very popular person, or not just popular, I'm talking about celebrities, if they want to destroy someone's reputation who is in, a, in an important high position, such as a government position, what do they do? They begin to accuse them of sexual misconduct. So this is the types of, even with celebrities, but they go to a further extent with pedophilia and the so on and so forth. The point is, Sexual temptation, if not used in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it to us and Islam has the most pure form, the most pure form in all of its ways, then my dear brothers and sisters, you will go low in the sight of Allah and you will go low in the sight of people and in the sight of yourself. And your mind will be taunted begin to misjudge things. Yusuf alayhi salam said this, and this is what he was afraid of, this and in the hereafter. Allah replies by saying, فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ His Lord responded to him, فَصَرَفَ عَنْهُ كَيْدَهُنْ Allah prevented him from them. إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Allah hears all things and knows all things. He hears your dua and he knows your problems. This is a gift to Yusuf alayhi salam. And I would like to quote a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which is in Sahih Muslim and Bukhari, but just in different order, mentioned in both books. However, the hadith is about the seven people who will be shaded on the Day of Judgment, on the day when there will be no shade but Allah's shade. And these seven types of people are Imam Adil, a just ruler, a young person who was raised in the worship of Allah in his youth or her youth, a man whose heart is cling to the masjids. So when they enter it and they exit it, they look forward to coming back. Two people who love each other only for the sake of Allah, when they meet, they meet on that, and when they depart, they depart on that. A person who gives in charity, in secret, only des desiring the pleasure of Allah, so much so, metaphorically speaking, his left hand doesn't know what his right hand even gave in charity. A person who remembers Allah in the deepness of the night and begins to call upon Allah, whether in hope or fear, and then his eyes begin to tear. 
out of remembrance to Allah. A person, a man or a woman, but here in the context is a man, whom a woman with status and beauty calls them to do haram with her, to, to the bed. And he says, Inni akhafullah, I fear Allah. Is that seven? Anyone count them? That's seven, I think we counted seven. But the point of that is, a man whom a woman with status and beauty calls him to bed and he says, I fear Allah. Inni akhafullah. Does it apply to the women? Yes, to a lesser extent, however. And that's because of the biological nature which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created the two genders in. But it applies also to the woman. For Allah, the Prophet mentioned it to the man here because it often and most likely occurs to the man. Brothers and sisters, the story moves on. Yusuf alayhi salam, what happened to him? He entered the prison with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah tells us in the Quran, ثُمَّ بَدَا لَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا رَأَوُ الْآيَاتِ لَيَسْجُنُنَّهُ حَتَّى حِينَ then it occurred to them after they had seen the signs that they should imprison him for a time. Who? It occurred to the minister, his master, and to his woman, his wife. It occurred to them that, you know, with all this news going around about us, my woman seducing him and all that stuff, it's about to cause me a bad reputation because, as I said before, he was a man of high position in the government, such a... Uh, such, uh, uh, you know, such a rumor is no good for him. So they saw that it was best befitting to lie to the people, accuse Yusuf alayhi salam of seducing the Aziz's wife instead. And so in the hadith it says, or in one, one narration it says that they went around with a big drum calling the people in the streets saying, come here, Yusuf has seduced the woman of the minister. And so when the news went about like that, in order to change and reverse the situation, Yusuf salam found himself in the prison. This is actually the will of Allah, as we said. It is not the minister or anyone else. It is only because Yusuf salam sought help from Allah and Allah came to his aid. But again, there is actually a bigger plan why he entered the prison. This is only in the course of action. Because this is the qada and qadr of Allah. Brothers and sisters in Islam, you should always remember, no matter what happens to you in life, whether it is good or bad, your trust is in Allah. You say, oh Allah, I trust in what you are doing. Whether it is a punishment for me, I repent. If it is a trial for me, I will persevere. But I know that at the end of it, good will come out. Good will come out. This is the state of the believer whom the Prophet ﷺ became amazed of in one hadith. He says, I am amazed of him. Allah then says, وَدَخَلَ مَعَهُ السِّجْنَ فَتَيَانِ قَالَ أَحَدُهُمَا إِنِّي أَرَانِي أَعْصِرُ خَمْرًا وَقَالَ الْآخَرُ إِنِّي which means and they entered into the prison with him two youths two young men one of them said I dreamt that I was pressing wine. And the other said, I dreamt that I was carrying bread on my head, of which the birds were eating. Tell us their interpretation, for we see you are of the righteous. Yusuf alayhi salam, from his character and the way he presented himself in the prison, immediately the people of the prison, all of them, they realized the righteousness in Yusuf alayhi salam. These were criminals. These were criminals. I tell you, brothers and sisters, if you, and especially the young ones among the males especially, we live in a world where thug life is taunting young men. 
thug life, especially with a life of rap. It is accompanied with this popular music, the pop culture of rap and the likes. And it calls you to be violent in some ways, and it calls you to rebel in other ways. It also calls you to degrade women in other ways as well. You just have to watch their clips. Don't do that. But their clips will tell you a lot about them, as I was told. And obviously you see them on the commercials. You know what I'm talking about. Thug life, my dear brothers, whoever is onto that road, or sisters who are onto that road, be aware of it. When you are a friend of a thug and you call yourself a thug, that friend of yours is not a friend. They have no friends. And they will take any opportunity to ruin your life if they can get a benefit out of it. They will blackmail you. They will accuse you. They will stand you up so long as they have a benefit from it. However, the hardest thug on the face of the earth, if you are righteous and a good believer, they will respect you. They will respect you. I've been to the prisons before and I know of brothers who've gone to the prisons to give da'wah to them. They always tell me, brother, the Muslim criminals in the prison have utter respect, has, have em enormous respect for us. When we go in there, they gather around you. They monitor their words. They monitor their actions. They ask you questions of relief. They want to be saved. They want help. They come to you. And they will respect you. Because Allah lifts the person who is righteous to Allah. Allah says to his angels, I love so and so, so love him. Then the angels say, we love him. And he says it to Jibreel. And Jibreel loves him. Then the angels love him. Then all the people of earth whom Allah loves, will all, he will cause them to love him. So Yusuf salam became that figure in the prison. And at, on another note, brothers and sisters, this shows us that no one on the face of the earth should be deprived the da'wah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The teaching of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's message. You can never say, I hear of brothers or sisters talking about others who are criminals or they've got a bad life, they've gone into that ugly life and they say they don't deserve to be guided. I've even heard some people make a dua against them saying, oh Allah, please never guide them. This is not a good dua. Allah guides whomever he wills and he leads astray whomever he knows deserves it, whomever he wills. No, every single person should be looked at as a potential Muslim, as a potential ta'ib, repentant. Don't ever, this is not in your hands. And remember, Nuh alayhi salam, the people who followed him were among the lowest in status. And the people of highest status said to him, we'll become Muslims and follow you if they get out. We won't mix with them. Nuh alayhi salam said, never. Who am I to choose who to guide and who not to? Or when the Prophet Muhammad turned away from the blind man, you know, not out of degradation to him, but he thought that the noble people of Quraysh are more important at this stage. Allah sent a verse in the Quran, Abasa wa tawalla. He frowned and turned away from him when the blind man came to him. So any person is a potential believer, and this religion is not ours, it's for Allah, and we are to pass it on. So criminals, yes, they need us. They need us. And Yusuf began to call them to the deen. When they knew that Yusuf knew the interpretations of dreams and so on from knowing him for a few days, they told him about this dream that each one of them have had. One was pressing one, the other one saw that he was carrying bread on his head and the birds were eating from it. They wanted the interpretation of it, O righteous man. Listen to what Yusuf replies. He says, قَالَ لَا يَأْتِيكُمَا طَعَامٌ تُرْزَقَانِهِ إِلَّا نَبَّأْتُكُمَا بِتَأْوِيلِهِ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَأْتِيَكُمَا ذَلِكُمَا مِمَّا عَلَّمَنِي رَبِّي إِنِّي تَرَكْتُ مِلَّةَ قَوْمٍ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَهُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ كَافِرُونَ Which means... He said, before the next meal comes to you, I will certainly reveal to you the interpretations. Like, if a meal comes to you, I'll tell you if it's bitter or sour or sweet or whatever, or salty. This is from what my Lord has taught me. What he first began to do was, he gave him an introduction to his ability to interpret. But he didn't interpret their dreams yet. Before going on to interpreting their dreams, he is now slowly directing them in another pathway. 
a pathway of teaching them something that will benefit them of more importance. What is that? Introducing Allah to them. He says, everything you see of me, I have been taught by Allah. So don't look at me as someone special. The special one is the one who sent me. That's what he's telling them. So a connection. If you think I'm great, let me introduce you to the one who made me. Allah. If you think that what I have of abilities and skills is amazing, let me tell you who gave them to me. And that if he did not give them to me, I would not have them. So I do not praise myself with what I have. This is a lesson for all of us, brothers and sisters, to be humble and never to take, you know, be proud as in, as in haughtiness, in an evil way. Boast about what you have. What you have is from Allah. Whether it is money, wealth, a good body, looks, an eloquent tongue, a particular skill in sport, a nice voice, whatever it is, never boast about it and never show off. Remember that the one who gave it to you can take it away like that. Like that. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Man rafa'a. Whoever humbles themselves for the sake of Allah, Allah will surely lift them high in status in this world and the hereafter. And remember, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he became the Khalifa, he sent a letter to the Emperor of Rome, of Byzantine. He said to him, when he called him to Islam and called him to this, the emperor became boastful. He said to him in the letter, after giving him da'wah, he said, Atatakabbaru ala Allah. Are you feeling yourself boastful above Allah, your creator? Kayfa tatakabbaru ala Allah wa anta alladhi nazalta min majra al-bawli marratayn? How can you be boastful above Allah and show off when you came out of where urine, urine comes out from twice? You came out from that same place twice, where urine comes out from. First from your father, then from your mother, when you were born. Remember, Allah says in the Quran, and then He gave him the verse, Let man remember where they were created from. He was created from a gushing type of fluid. The type of fluid that if you were to be seen with it on your clothing, you would be embarrassed. This is what we were made from. So don't boast over what you have. And humble yourself, Allah will lift you, my dear brothers and sisters. You are, what you have is from Allah. There is nothing from me, nothing for me. Everything is for Allah, everything is from Allah. Always remember that. I am level with the ground. And lastly, Umar ibn al-Khattab, anhu, when he was dying, his son placed his head on his lap. He's dying. And his son, Abdullah, placed his head on his lap. And his father, Umar, being the Khalifa and the role model, he said he had given his Khilafah to someone else at that time. And he said, put my head on the ground, my son. His son said, Father, I like it to be up on my lap. He said, put my head on the ground where it belongs. I was created from the soil and to it I shall return. Today I am not the leader, but a humble servant of Allah. So he placed his head on the soil. This is how he died, radiallahu anhu. From it we were created to it we return. Informing us that no matter how, he was of the highest status as a leader of the believers, Umar radiallahu anhu, showing people, even I am nothing without Allah. So Yusuf alayhi salam is telling them, what I have is from Allah. He taught me this. I didn't know it from myself. So don't thank me for what I'm about to tell you. Thank Allah, your creator, for what I'm about to tell you. Okay, everyone? So the gratitude is, belongs all to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you want to praise someone, say it to them, but say the following words. Oh, what great things which Allah has given you. And there is no one better than Allah. So add these words to a person when they say, Oh, MashaAllah, what Allah has willed and given you. So when you want to praise someone or praise your... And, try and never praise yourselves. Allah is the one who knows truly who is righteous. Then Yusuf salam goes on by saying... <clears throat> This is from what my Lord has taught me. Surely I have forsaken the ways of a people who do not believe in Allah 
and they neither believe in the hereafter. He's telling them, with all the things that you've seen in me, and you've called me righteous, and you've seen these abilities in me, I left the religion of a people who did not believe in the hereafter. He's not talking about his father. He's talking about the tribes that are connected to, his, to him. A lot of them rejected the beliefs of their fathers and their forefathers, the, the prophets, meaning Yaqub and, and the prophets and Ibrahim. He said, I left their belief. I had the opportunity to follow them. My, you know, my, uh, my tribe, my people's tradition. But I did not. Because they disbelieved in Allah in the hereafter. And so I rejected their traditions. And I followed, he says, in the Quran, وَاتَّبَعْتُ مِلَّةَ آبَائِي إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ مَا كَانَ لَنَا أَن نُشْرِكَ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ ذَلِكَ مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ عَلَيْنَا وَعَلَى النَّاسِ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرُ and I have followed the religion of my fathers, Ibrahim, and Ishaq, and Yaqub. It is not ours to associate anything with Allah. This is from Allah's bounty upon us and upon the people. But most of the people are not grateful. So now he has addressed them about Allah and his favors upon us in guiding us to the straight path. Then he says, يا صاحبي السجن أأرباب متفرقون خير أم الله الواحد القهار ما تعبدون من دونه إلا أسماء سميتموها سميتموها Which means, O oh my fellow prisoners, are many different types of lords better or Allah, the one, the dominant? What you are worshipping other than him are only names which you have made up, you and your fathers, for which Allah has sent down no authority. He didn't teach us these names. Most surely, the command is for none but for Allah. He had commanded that you shall not worship any other than him. This is the true religion. It's the true way of life. But most people just do not know. They don't want to know. They don't seek the knowledge. They're too busy with other things. In this there is great wisdom, my brothers and sisters, in this one verse is enormous understanding and meaning of the proper meaning of Tawheed, of monotheism, the worship of one true God, and the rejection of all false deities and false pieces of information which make partners with Allah, even if they come from the most beloved people to you and the people you owe honor and respect to, such as your fathers, your mothers, your relatives, your uncles and aunties, your ancestors, your people of authority, even your sheikhs, but sheikhs will never do something like that. But in my, in, back in Lebanon uh, and in other countries, they call certain people sheikhs that do not deserve that name. They are not knowledgeable and they are people who have taken on the word name of sheikh and they're dressed like sheikhs, but they teach the people actions of sorcery, making partners with Allah and innovative matters such as calling upon the dead, calling upon uh, uh, you know, people who were called by righteous names, taking their children to their graves for healing, doing actions of sorcery in the name of good. And this is all, this all comes with shirk in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Teaching them traditions such as, as we said before, knocking on wood, 
to keep away bad luck. This is based on shirk of people who thought that spirits used to go into trees. So they used to hang up and bless themselves from trees. And wood is made of trees. And so on and so forth. Swearing oath by other than Allah. Such as swearing on my mother's grave, they say. Swearing on my honor. Swearing on my mustache. <laughs> they say this in Arab terms. They say. By the honor of my mustache. By the honor of myself. And so on and so forth. This is all part of following traditions of past ancestors that Allah did not send down at all. We have in my father's village in Lebanon a grave which is probably fits, it can fit about, I'd say about five people um, in a row. That's how big it is. And the name of the person they've given in that grave is Marmar. Marmar. I've never heard of this name in the Quran or in anywhere in the traditions of Islam. Marmar. But I heard about it in the books of the Christians. And they say he is a noble wali of God. They take their kids there for healing. If the woman wants to get pregnant, she goes there. If uh, they, they're not even allowed to touch any of the trees around him because they say this is a sanctuary for the prophet Marmar in that grave. So no one touches the trees, even if they need them. So these are names, I'll just give you an example, I'd like to attack myself, so I don't uh, you know, offend anyone. These are names which they bring about, and customs and traditions which they bring about. Allah tells us in the Quran, why do you worship other than what Allah has brought you to the people of, of, of Quraysh? And they used to say, بَلْ نَعْبُدُ مَا أَلْفَيْنَا عَلَيْهِ أَبَاءَنَا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُ مَا أَلْفَيْنَا عَلَيْهِ أَبَاءَنَا We are going to follow what we found our forefathers on. And this is... Even within Muslims, sadly, today, they call themselves Muslims and they say we submit ourselves to Allah and His laws. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. But when you look at their actions inside their religion, they have taken on customs and traditions of their forefathers and their country where they come from and they don't care whether it fits with the sunnah or not. They just take it on and do it and insist on others and they get upset with you if you don't do it. And they will cut you off of their relationships, of their bloodline. If you don't follow what they do in their traditions, whether it be marriage or celebrations or some type of eating procedure, if it has got something to do with the religion, I'm talking about. I'm not talking about customs that have nothing to do with the deen. Such as, you know, uh, these people like to eat this way or these people like to dress this way. So long as it's halal within Islamic rights, customs are okay. But when it has something to do with worship and deen within the religion, then it becomes haram if it doesn't agree with our religion. So now the point is Yusuf alayhi salam, he called the prisoners to Allah. He gave them da'wah of tawheed. Two things. Number one, once you have gained the trust and you have gained the love, well not necessarily the love, but you've gained the trust and the friendship of other people, now they like speaking to you, then that is when it is, your da'wah is beneficial. You call them to the deen. I know of some people, they meet someone for the first time and they still don't even know them and they say to them, I invite you to accept Islam. You haven't even taught them anything. They don't know anything about your deen. In fact, I remember one person uh, stood up, held the Quran and said, you people are full of corruption, filth and all you want is degradation for women by taking off their hijab. You want this and you eat the swine. After saying all of this, she said, he said, and now I invite you to accept the Qur'an. <laughs> so, you put the other person down and then you invite him to your religion. They're going to look at you and say, I will never enter a religion that teaches you this type of manners. This type of character. So, Allah says in the Qur'an, فَذَكِّرْ إِنْ نَفَعَتِ الذِّكْرَى The benefit that benefits, the, the, piece of, the, the uh, remembrance that benefits the people, use that. Don't just cut and paste anything and just throw anything at people. All right, have some wisdom, win them to your side, and the best thing is with neighbors. Show them some concern, show them consideration. Uh, when you make some kind of a food, it's nice, pass it on to them. Say hello, say this, say that, help them. And when they see this kindness from you, then slowly you are able to give them da'wah. For character of Islam is da'wah in itself. And then you can use your verbal uh, comments with them. For example, I had a neighbor who sees me wear these. You know, I come out of my house wearing this outfit every now and then. He's a Christian Lebanese. When we first got to meet him, 
It was, hello, how are you? Talking about Lebanon, talking about this, talking about, you know, common things. Having a cup of coffee together. And then one day, the neighbor said to me, whatever you are on, stay on your religion. Stay on your iman. And I'm wondering why he said that. He saw the peace and the serenity in this outfit and in the character that we showed him. So then I was ready to give at least a hint about our deen. And the first thing I say to them is, you know our Quran says that you are from the people of the book and to Ahlul Kitab. You are the people of the book. And that is because we share some commonalities in the books. And so we went into a small discussion. Next time, inshallah, we're going to a bigger discussion. But Yusuf alayhi salam, this is what Allah is telling us. Earn the trust from the people and then give them da'wah. And the first thing you start off with is what? Issues pertaining to Tawheed, to Allah and to His words. So you don't go ahead and start with talking about, for example, uh, you know, pork or wine unnecessarily. Or talk about the beard straight away. Why don't you get everything and return it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just as Yusuf salam said, everything I know is from Allah. So now introducing him to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After telling him these things, he was ready to interpret their dreams for them. Now he's taken the responsibility off his shoulders and given it to them in clarity. Now Allah mentions a few verses about it, but obviously they went into a long discussion about Allah and Tawheed. Then when they were ready, Yusuf salam gave them the promise. He helped them with what they wanted of less importance. يا صاحبي السجن أما أحدكما فيسقي ربه خمرا وأما الآخر فيصلب فتأكل الطير من رأسه قضي الأمر الذي فيه تستفتيان O oh fellow prisoners, as for one of you, he shall pour wine for his master and as for the other, he shall be crucified and the bird shall eat of his head the matter whereupon you inquired is decreed. Not only did he tell them the interpretation of, of their dreams, but he also told them again, what the dream that you have seen is from Allah. He has decreed this matter. There is no changing it. I cannot advise you anymore. Allah has made qadr, things that are going to occur for a reason, and some things we have no control over. We submit to Allah and we try our best in whatever we have control over. And truly, they did become that. The first prisoner was taken out and he was crucified and the birds ate from his head. Some say they became Muslims, Allahu A'lam. The second prisoner was saved out and truly he became the wine, I don't know what you call it, the wine preparer of the Pharaoh, of the king, the Pharaoh. Look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing things closer and closer for what has been destined for Yusuf alayhi salam in the former dream he saw when he said, I saw... 11 planets or stars and the sun and the moon prostrating to me. The dream has not yet been fulfilled right up to this point. All of what has occurred is, in, is going in line with what is about to come from the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yusuf alayhi salam, when he saw the next prisoner leave, He said to him, Mention me to your master. Idhkurni inda rabbik. Mention me to the king and tell him that I am imprisoned without any crime or wrong. Can you tell your king that, please? Because the king doesn't know my state. And this verse, my brothers and sisters, is indicating to us a supporting evidence that we are allowed to seek help from people in means other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that it is not contrary to the reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when I said other than Allah I didn't mean that your heart is not connected to Allah you ask a friend for help but you know that he cannot or she cannot help you if Allah doesn't will it so long as you have that belief you're allowed to ask people for help so long as those people are able to help you like it's within their power you don't come and ask a person and say please forgive my sins this is not in the power of any human being. This is only in the power of Allah. So doing that is shirk. But you come and ask a person who is a doctor, can you please advise me of medicine and administer your uh, work on me so I may be cured? This is allowed. Because Allah is the one who gave the ability to a doctor to have some control in that way. 
But you must always know deep inside that if it wasn't for Allah, the doctor cannot heal you any, anyway. And if Allah doesn't want to, the doctor cannot heal you. If you have that, you're okay. But seeking things from people that they cannot help you with, flying, forgiveness, making you enter paradise, saving you from hellfire, it's only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dua and so on and so forth. When he asked the friend to ask the king to mention him, the shaitan made Yusuf alayhi salam, made the prisoner forget what Yusuf alayhi salam had asked him. Now, yes, the shaitan made him forget. But at the same time, Allah allowed it to be. You see, the shaitan has no power over the prophets. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave, allowed for the shaitan to make the prisoner forget what Yusuf alayhi salam had asked him to do. The scholars tell us there are two reasons for that. The first and foremost reason is that there is the will of Allah, a wisdom that Allah wants to bring about from it. Only Allah knows the wisdom in that. The second one, the scholars say, that based on a narration, that Allah alam it's sahih or not, but the narration is there, that when Yusuf alayhi salam asked the prisoner to mention him to his king, Jibreel alayhi salam came to Yusuf alayhi salam in the prison, and he said to him, Ya Yusuf, when your brothers threw you in the well, who is the one that saved you? He said, Allah. He said, when you were taken into slavery, who is the one that chose good masters for you? He said, Allah. He said, when the women seduced you, who is the one that saved you from it? He said, Allah. He said, what prevented you from asking Allah now again? Although it's allowed to ask others, the prophets are a little bit different. They ask Allah completely and sincerely. And obviously Yusuf Alayhi did have that in him. But Allah had a wisdom from it to show Yusuf Alayhi Salaam something which Yusuf Alayhi Salaam can understand. Allah says in the Quran, فَلَبِثَ فِي السِّجْنِ بِضْعَ سِنِينَ And so he remained in the prison for several more years. Another lesson that we can get out of it is, Allah wills things and we sometimes cannot understand why. And we may suffer a little bit more. This suffering is good for us. The prophets are a role model for us. If you think that you've gone through a lot of pain and it's been a long time, look at Yusuf alayhi salam. And remember the reason why Allah is telling the story to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu He was going through a lot of pain for a long while. So he's telling him, look what happened to Yusuf and he was patient and I'm giving you this to comfort you with it. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Bid'a sinin means several years. The word bid'a or bid'a bid in Arabic refers to any number between three and nine. So we can safe, safely say that Yusuf salam stayed in prison for anywhere between three years to nine years. Allah knows best how many years exactly. Then something extraordinary happened. Another means which Allah is bringing about within his qadr when he wants something to come out. The Pharaoh or the king, saw a dream. And by the way, the Pharaoh we're talking about here is not the Pharaoh that is mentioned in the Quran at the time of Musa alayhi salam. He comes later on. But Allah addresses the other one at the time of Musa as Pharaoh because the man is not significant enough to have his name being mentioned. So Allah said the Pharaoh, the so-called Pharaoh. But this Pharaoh was different. Some say that this Pharaoh followed the religion of Yusuf alayhi salam. But he was a good Pharaoh. He was a good king, a just ruler. The Pharaoh saw a dream. Allah says in the Quran, وَقَالَ الْمَلِكُ إِنِّي أَرَى سَبْعَ بَقَرَاتٍ سِمَانِي يَأْكُلُهُنَّ سَبْعٌ عِجَافٌ وَسَبْعَ سُنْبُلَاتٍ وسبع سنبلات خضر وأخر يابسات يا أيها الملأ أفتوني في رؤياي إن كنتم للرؤيا تعبرون Allah says and the king said not the pharaoh the king because he was worthy of being a king I saw seven fat cows in my dream. He saw seven fat cows in his dreams. And seven lean cows were devouring the fat cows. Seven skinny cows were eating the seven fat cows. Likewise, 
I saw seven green ears of corn. Corn, plants, and seven withered ones. Seven corn plants that were withered. They were dry, no fruit in them, nothing. O oh, chiefs, now he's addressing the people around him who were endued with so much knowledge and had high status. O oh, chiefs, explain to me my dream if you can interpret it. They said, the chiefs, قالوا, These are just confused dreams. And we know nothing of the interpretation of such type of dreams. Allah doesn't want them to answer it. This is not for you, O chiefs. Now it is time to bring about the one who deserves to be there. And he is Yusuf alayhi salam. Then he said, وَقَالَ الَّذِي نَجَى مِنْهُمَا وَادَّكَرَ بَعْدَ أُمَّةٍ أَنَا أُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِتَأْوِيلِهِ فَأَرْسِلُونَ Then said the one who had been released. Remember the prisoner? Now he remembered Yusuf alayhi salam. He said, who remembered after a long time, I will inform you of its interpretation. So send me forth. O king, I can tell you what it means. Send me. He said, go. He was going back to Yusuf alayhi salam. He remembered him. And Allah tells us in the Quran that he went to Yusuf Asam and he starts off with the name Yusuf wa ayyuha siddiq O oh, Yusuf, the truthful one. So he was so excited. O oh, Yusuf, the, Yusuf, the truthful one. Please interpret us the dream. Aftina, expound, give us your knowledge of seven fat cows which seven lean ones are eating them and seven green, uh, green ears and seven others dry that I might return to the people that they may know. So Yusuf gave him the interpretation. Listen to what he said. He said, For seven years you shall sow continuously. Meaning you'll have lots of crop. You will sow and you won't stop. You'll have abundance for seven years. Then what you reap of the harvest, leave it on the ear. Meaning these are what farmers know. What you reap, what you take out of your crops and your harvest, leave the grains inside of their mother stem leave it inside don't open it keep the, keep them inside except a little whereof you eat only open up what you really need to eat don't open up any more and store the rest away but within their mother stem clothed so they can be protected from parasites worms beetles insects preserved Then, after that, there shall come upon you seven hard years in which you shall devour all that you have reserved for them except a little you keep in store. He said, seven years are going to come that are going to be very hard. You're going to hardly be able to grow your crops. He said, you are going to need, you are going to need the amount of what you ate in the last seven years again. You will eat all of what you, what, what you reap in those next seven years and plus you will need more. Except the ones you've stored earlier. So keep them stored. Then there shall come after that a year in which the people have rain and in which they press wine. One year. Brothers and sisters, he said that there will be seven years of good and healthy harvest, followed by seven years of drought and famine. Then there shall come after that a year in which the people have rain and in which they press wine. They should store up all the grains of the first seven years in their ears, except what they ate. They should also sow small amounts of seeds in the second seven years, because it probably um, would not grow due to the shortage of the rain. So it would be waste of grains. You see what he's telling them? He's telling them, you know those grains that you stored? Don't use them to plant again. Because they reuse the plants, right? He said, take a little bit and plant. Because it's not going to be enough rain for them to grow. And you're going to waste all of what you stored. So take only what you need from what you stored in the last seven years. And plant a little bit of them again. Keep what you've stored. Why am I repeating this to you? This is the extraordinary ability which Allah had given Yusuf alayhi salam. Not only did he know the interpretations of the dreams, but he even knew how to manage and tell them how to take care of themselves so they don't die of hunger. 
This is extraordinary. When the king heard about that, he was taken to extraordinary shock, surprise. He was so impressed. He said to him, go and get me him. Come, bring him to me. Now listen to how Allah is turning things around. When he went there, the prisoner, he said to him, the king wants you. Yusuf salam knew that this was good news, but there was something wrong. Yusuf salam is still accused of something which he didn't do. He refused to get out of the prison until he was proven innocent, until everybody knew. So he said to him, قَالَ رَجَعْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ He said, go back to your Lord, the king. فَاسْأَلْهُ مَا بَالُ النِّسْوَةِ اللَّاتِ قَطَّعْنَ أَيْدِيَهُنْ Ask him concerning the women who cut their palms. Everybody knew about it, you see. He said, ask him about that. I want, him to get into a tr- I want them to get into a trial. إِنَّ رَبِّ بِكَيْدِهِنَّ عَلِيمٌ My Lord, meaning my minister, not Allah, the minister, his master, he knows the truth about what these women were plotting. So what is he telling him? Saying, O oh king, get those women and get your minister and question them. Your minister knows what I'm talking about. Meaning, get his wife after as well. And they will tell you the whole truth. When, he, when the king got this, he called them and he put them to trial. And Allah tells us, the women came along first. The ones who cut their palms. قُلْنَا And they said, حَاشَ لِلَّهِ God forbid. مَا عَلِمْنَا عَلَيْهِ مِنْ سُوءٍ We don't know any bad or guilt upon him. The women, they confessed. The women admitted. Because now they're afraid. So they told the truth. They said, no, no. Yusuf is absolutely clean. So they brought the minister and he also told them the truth. The wife came along and she said, الآن حص حص الحق now the truth has been made undoubtedly clear. أنا راوته عن نفسي. I am the one who seduced him upon himself. وإنه لمن الصادقين. He is among the truthful ones.